All right, chapter 6, what everybody reads Revelation for. Or at least it's what I read it for. I mean, it's a great chapter. Where were they? You don't want to know. In the bag? No, they're in Andy's truck. That's a good place for them. Well, the thing was, he knew about it a week ago. What was he going to tell you? All right. All right, chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. When he had opened the second seal, I heard a second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat upon thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou heard not the oil and the wine. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And a power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little, that they should rest for a little, oh, a little season. They should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath will come, and who shall be able to stand? Okay. So that's chapter 6. Okay, so that answers the question, who is worthy to open the book? So the Lamb, Jesus, mm -hmm. is the one able to open. Seven seals, I think we mentioned this last week, last week but the, the seven seals, seven being that which only God can do, has done, or will do. Uh, so the number seven is always symbolic. Uh, and there's seven parts of this vision, and there are seven total visions in the book. And then a voice... A voice like thunder, one of the living creatures said with a voice like thunder. So God's majestic and creative power is always implied by thunder. And you think of, you know, who was there at the creation? God, that was all there was. And how did he create? He talked. He created the universe by speaking it into existence. Okay, so the first seal... I looked and behold a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. All right, so white, I, I think the colors are neat, so I'm going to give you a little Greek. So leukos is the word for white, which is where we get the name leukocyte, your white blood cells, right? Leukocytes, that's where that comes from. Uh, so leukos, white, white usually symbolizes victory, but this time it's a deception. So usually when you see white, you see 
someone who is conquering, like it says, conquering and to conquer, you see victory. White is the color of victory, the banner. Banners of victory are white. Uh, and sometimes people get this white horseman confused with Jesus. They'll say that this is Jesus. It's not Jesus. Uh, that is Revelation 12, when you see uh, Christus Victor, the victorious Christ, on a white horse. Then it's Jesus, but not this time. So when you see someone trying to look like Christ and it's not, who is that? Someone who's trying to imitate God. Who's that usually? Right, it's Satan, right? Satan is always the, the great, the great uh, mimic. Uh, and man, too. You know, we try to be God and obviously fail. So he has, so it's deception. This does, isn't victory. It's actually war. It's the exact opposite. Well, it's what takes place before there can be a victory. So he has a bow, which is a weapon of war. It is also a impersonal weapon, right? You can kill people at a distance. That was the great innovation, right? They uh, invented the longbow in like 1066, Battle of Hastings. And the next thing you know, we have like mastered warfare. We can shoot people from way far away. Uh, I don't have to actually know them. I don't have to actually look in their eyes. I can kill you and you're not going to see it coming. So it's impersonal and distant warfare. It's like snipers, yeah. Okay. So this first horseman is described as a rider. It's rider. The other ones are going to be described as another rider or, you know, um, and its rider. But this one is described as a rider and then all the ones that come after are going to be another rider. Uh, grammatically in the original language. You don't quite get that in English. But the, the grammar implies that the next three horsemen are kind of equal to him. So he's not above the other horsemen, but uh, they may follow out of him. So he goes first and they naturally follow. You can kind of get that out of the grammar. It's going to sound a little confusing at first, but you'll get it as we talk more about it. Uh, again, sometimes they even depict it as Jesus in art. No, they, uh, he is not Jesus. Um, because these other writers, grammatically being equivalent to this first writer, it can't be Jesus because no one's equal to him. Jesus is opening seals. Right, and also Jesus is the one opening the seals. So we're not having some weird split personality thing going on. Uh, and again, we'll see in Revelation 19 is when we see him as the great writer. Uh, Albrecht Durer, the great uh, artist and engraver of the Reformation era, uh, is the one that corrected the depiction. They always depicted it as kind of like Jesus on this horse in, in artwork of the four horsemen. Albrecht Durer was the first one to actually kind of correct it and get it right. And then people first copied him. <clears throat> so... Since I mentioned him, he was a German Renaissance artist, uh, famous for all his paintings and engravings. And his engravings of Christ's passion, so the, the passion story, are incredible. It gives you the, the illusion almost of color and shades of gray, of the way, because his, his engraving was so lifelike, uh, which captured a lot of emotion. Uh, art didn't do that, engraving didn't really do that before. There were gifted art. There were gifted engravers, and then there's like Gustav Dor and and Albrecht Dor uh, were just absolutely masters. And then probably the most famous drawing, Christian drawing ever, is the praying hands. You've seen that blue background, white chalk. Uh, that Dor drew that. He is the one that did that. Um, he was Lutheran by sympathy, I guess you would say. He was he was never actually formally converted, but he was very sympathetic of the, uh, the Lutheran cause and the problems with the uh, Catholic Church, but he never formally left it. Uh, but we do know from some correspondence that he was very, very sympathetic toward uh, the Lutherans. One of his last desires on earth was to engrave uh, an engraving of Martin Luther, which he never uh, got to do because he died before he had the chance. Okay, so this white horse, 
White Horse's War, or you can also say tyranny, not just war, but tyranny. White is the opposite of darkness, right? And that's what the devil does, because war and tyranny are dark. But this horse is white. Why? Because the devil is the great imitator, always trying to be like God, but he's not. So Lucifer, his very name means the light bringer. Lucifer is the light bringer, or even the morning star, uh, which Jesus is called the morning star. So he, Lucifer is called star of the morning. Jesus is called the morning star. So you can see how he's always copying. Uh, the devil always tries to imitate the light. And scripture even tells us he is an angel of darkness, but he looks like an angel of light. He looks like he's the most beautiful angel that God created. Okay, so if you look at the devil, you're going to see like the handsomest guy you ever saw. And there's no horns in pitchfork. We did that in media. Uh, so who is this on the white horse? It is the Antichrist. Uh, Antichrist with a capital A. It's the devil. That's Satan on that horse. Uh, so he is loosed, and Satan's influence causes war, causes tyranny, causes everything that we do that's bad. He doesn't make us do it. He just tells us what we want to hear. He's wearing a crown, which symbolizes victory, symbolizes leadership. Uh, it is the metaphor we have for the honor that you receive for having done something, some great victory. We talked about the grass crown last week, right? In Roman, mm -hmm. uh, Roman uh, legions, if your men fashioned a crown out of the weeds of the ground, wherever you just had a battle and you give it to your, your general, that is one of the highest honors you could receive in the empire. So you, you are given a crown because you have achieved something. You've been coronated king. You've uh, had some great accomplishments. Uh, like the laurel, like when they would do a triumph after a battle and they parade all the spoils of war and they would hold the laurel leaf crown over your head. Yeah, that was that. You say, oh, you've, you've achieved your laurels or you've gotten your laurels. That's where that comes from. Uh, so that crown symbolizes some great accomplishment. All right, so what's the devil's great accomplishment? All right. So his work in the world, his conquering is in temporal world in the land of time. It's what he does is create unrest, pit man against man, war, men lording it over other men, tyranny. That's Satan's great accomplishment. Uh, and it is also his death rattle because as we know, the victory's already won. He's still kicking, much like a snake when you cut the head off the body is still squirming around. But the eternal victory is already won. Right, sin, death, and power, devil are done. So all these things we're about to hear in the rest of this chapter, we know it's okay because they don't matter. None of this matters. So now you get the second horse, equal to the first, but he follows after the first. Or he's maybe even we could interpret it that these other horses are simultaneous with the first, that they all come roaring out together. Uh, and it makes sense because this one is bright red. Uh, what does ESV have? Bright red. Yeah, bright this red. says fiery red. Fiery red is better. Uh, better because the word is pyros, where we get pyromania, where mm. you get everything that has to do with fire. Uh, the pyroles are a, are a group of pigments, synthetic pigments, uh, that they use to replace the cadmiums because they're poisonous, poisonous. So your pyrrole reds, our heavy straining, bright red, fiery red, intense red pigments. I mean, they're just, it's, when you look at that, you go, that's red. I mean, that's really red. No hint of orange, no nothing. It's like pure bright red. So that is that word, pyros. That's where the way this horse is described is a fiery red horse. And he is allowed to take peace from the earth. Okay, so when you take peace from the earth, people can kill one another. He's given a great sword. Um, the red horse is the result of the white horse. So you have the white horse, which is war and tyranny. So what follows war and tyranny? Blood. Blood. Bloodshed, civil unrest, and rebellion. 
that's what follows war. So that's why you have red bloodshed. Uh, men could kill each other. It's man's inhumanity to man. Yeah, the devil loves it. The devil loves to imitate Jesus and tell us that all this stuff we want to do is okay. But we sure like killing each other too. Rebellion, civil unrest. The red horse is the result of the white horse. You know, look at Adam and Eve after the devil deceived them. All right? So what's the very next thing we see happen? I mean, it's not necessarily the very next thing that happened in the garden, but what happens? Adam and Eve sin, Cain kills Abel. That's like the next story, right? So you have you have someone that goes out to conquer and to cause rebellion and war. And the very next thing that happens is bloodshed, the first murder. Okay, so rebellion and civil unrest follow war and tyranny. And then verse five and six, we get the third sale, the third horseman. So third living creature says, come and behold a black horse. And that rider had a pair of scales in his hand and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the middle of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. I don't get that one. Oh yeah, we'll get to that one. This is good. This is good stuff. All right, so you have war and war creates bloodshed and what happens after that? Death. Poverty. Poverty. Death, death, death is the next one. So next, first we got to have poverty, scarcity, lack. All right. So again, you can see that this horseman can be simultaneous with the first one. That one goes marching out to war, and these other three are just pulled along in his wake, like like a like a smart car drifting behind a semi. Awesome analogy that is. If you know what a smart, have you ever seen one of those things? I I, I actually. There's a couple of kids at my daughter's school, and I found out where I happened to notice oh, that's one of the kids that goes to her school because they've got like their two grown up cars in the parking lot, and then there's their their mailbox, but it's on like this where the sidewalk would be. So there's this small space between the mailbox and the curb, and he's got the car parked long ways, <laughs> like off the driveway right there because it fits in that little spot. You're just going, that ain't right. Anyway, tiny, tiny car. Okay, black. Horseman, melos, great word too. Greek word for the for black used here, melos, where we get words like melanin, which makes us brown or not. The more melanin you have in your skin, the darker your skin. It's where we get the word melanoma for skin cancer. Black is the symbol of famine and starvation. Now they have, this horseman has a pair of scales. So a pair of scales, because balance is good, right? Balance is good. You use that to measure weight, to balance one thing and it's another. Justice is blind and balanced, right? Justice has scales. Okay, so it was prophesied in Ezekiel 4.16 that Jerusalem would be held captive by Babylon's cutting off their food supply. So there is an Old Testament image or hist of their history that they're calling back to a little bit. Uh, if you cut somebody's food supply off, you control them, right? If you cut off your water supply, you definitely control them. All right, so we have war and bloodshed. So now we have to have inflation follows and also price controls. Starting to sound really familiar. <laughs> yeah, and guess what? This stuff happened back then too. It really did. Uh, a quart, the word translated as quart, what did this one do? Quinox. What's yours got? Well, there's a little footnote. Oh, says Koinex? Koinex, mm -hmm. probably about a liter. Yeah, so a Koinex is 1.2 dry measure quarts which is approximately 3,600 calories. So a, for a denarius, a quart of wheat. So one coinix, 3,600 calories. For a denarius, a denarius in that time is one day's wages. So 3,600 calories for one day's wages. That's a little spendy. Yeah. That's, one, that's like one day's calories, right? For you know, like a, a guy that a for a laborer, yeah. one day's wages for one person's caloric intake. 
Uh, but that wheat is also good nutrition. That's high, high nutrition. Uh, that's about 1,500% inflation, to put it in perspective. So, yeah, one, one denarius would get you, like, a lot more wheat than that. All right? Uh, three conakes of barley for a denarius. Barley has about the same caloric food value by dry weight as wheat, but it's less nutritious, so you have to eat three times as much of it to get the same. Uh, so again, very high, uh, very high inflation. So all of a laborer's wages would go just to food, and that would barely be enough to live on. All right, now the average family in the world today, the world, not the United States, the world, is 3.5 people. And in the first century, families were bigger. So, yeah, this is not good. These, they're going to starve. It's poverty. Uh, price fixing controls the inflation from running away, which you have to do that sometimes. Um, they did that, what, in Argentina? When that ran away, they had something like 1,500% inflation. And, like, you couldn't buy, like, an egg. An egg was, like, worth its weight in gold. One egg, right? Uh, that happened in Germany. That's how the Nazis came to power, because their economy collapsed. There was hyperinflation, and, you know, the National Socialist says, we could fix this. I'm like, well, okay, because anything's got to be better than this, and that allowed them to rise to power. Uh, so you could even put this horse behind one of the other horses. These things always follow each other, whichever one comes first. So you could have the poverty and shortage, and that could give rise to tyranny, uh, which then gives rise to war. Okay, but do not harm the oil and the wine, which sounds like kind of a contradiction, right? Well, why would you don't harm the oil and the wine? Because oil and wine are luxuries, right? So grapes and olives could be grown anywhere. I mean, you can grow them just about anywhere. Only certain land was good for raising grain. So there were a lot of provinces in the empire, and it's actually, you can connect the dots in Roman history, uh, looking at where grain was being grown. Um, so only certain lands were good for raising grain. Uh, many provinces in the empire were fully dependent on other places to export grain to them uh, because they couldn't grow any of their own. Uh, the only way that the population could survive in that area is if they import grain from someplace else. And you know, now someone has control over you when that happens. Okay, in the year 92, the divine emperor Domitian ordered price controls by destroying one half of the plentiful grape harvest, increasing the price of wine and if wine were plentiful, resulting in a low selling price, merchants would not make enough profit to afford their daily bread, to afford their daily grain. So luxury items were plentiful, but no one could afford it because you couldn't pay for food. So that was an actual event from history, and Revelation was probably written after that happened. Uh, John's an old man by now. It's got to be about 90, 95, 95, 96, 97, 98 when he's writing this. So this is in recent memory when that happened. So it destroyed half of the grape harvest just to up the price of wine. So that third horseman, poverty, symbolizes inflation, famine, starvation, economic imbalance. I mean, don't make too big a political issue out of it, but unfairness. You know, you have haves and you have haves not, have nots. The uh, you know the rich people can still afford luxuries even when the economy is in a complete toilet. The most rich elite don't notice, right? That does not affect, the little people do not affect me, right? Uh, must be nice. All right, so poverty. And then we come to the fourth seal. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Okay. So pale horse is a terrible translation of the Greek word chloros, which is a very specific color 
Uh, it's used in the Septuagint. The word koros is only ever used elsewhere in the Bible in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it's that color, that livid yellow-green color of vegetables. So if you take a cucumber that's been growing on the ground and you turn it over and it's got that pale, yellowy, greeny ugh, color, that's what that color is. That's chloros. Uh, so it is also the livid, decaying color of a corpse. Uh, when I teach this with kids, I, I teach them that it's like Scooby-Doo ghost green. Mm -hmm. kind of works. Uh, that's where we get the word chlorophyll from, uh, which plants use to turn sunlight into energy and gives them their green color. Uh, Brighton, the guy that wrote the Concordia Commentary on Revelation, translates it himself as ghostly green. So corpse, corpse green. I like that. So chloros. Um, there is zero symbolic language here in this one. He identifies the rider of the horse as death and uses the Greek word Hades uh, as following closely behind him. So the abode of the dead in Greek mythology is Hades, uh, which then we get our word hell. So the Bible's a little weird with the concept of hell and the name of hell. So in the Old Testament, you have Sheol. Right, that is the Jewish underworld, the place of the dead, for both good and bad. All right, and then you have in Greek mythologies the Greek mythology again, the underworld, Hades, which is also good and bad. There's no, I mean, it's a little worse, but really in Greek mythology, it's for the good and the bad. You know? they, and most mythologies actually have it that way. In Norse mythology, uh, if you die in glorious battle, you go to Asgard, right? But uh, in, or you go to, sorry, Valhalla. Uh, but if you just die of old age, or you're a woman, or you're a child and you die, you go to the underworld, to Niflheim, uh, which is not hell, because there actually is a hell, but that's just where dead people go that didn't die in glorious battle. So all these different cultures have all these different concepts of the underworld that are not, not necessarily the place of punishment. But for us, and for New Testament, and for the, the Jewish converts, the idea of hell has been established as a place of punishment. Uh, death and hell were given authority, which is what's interesting about, about this horseman. So death and Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with swords and so forth. So... Death and hell are given authority by God, right? The lamb opened the seals, which allows them to do what they're doing. So God allows this. Why does a gracious God allow suffering? There's that big question everybody asks times, one time or another, we always, oh, if God loves us so much, why do people suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is it happening to me? Why is it happening now? But God is merciful and just. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ our Lord. So all the suffering happens for a reason, and the reason is somehow God is using that to turn someone to him either the person that's suffering it or the person who's going to aid that person in their suffering. Somehow he is going to turn that suffering is always going to be turned around to his glory. Um, it's not necessarily fun for us when we're the one enduring it, but... Uh, in the study guide part here at the bottom it says, <clears throat> the four riders are given power over one-fourth of the earth, indicating that God is still limiting his judgment. Mm -hmm. It is not yet complete. With these judgments, there is still time for unbelievers to turn to Christ and always from their sin. In this case, the limited punishment not only demonstrates God's wrath on sin, but also his merciful love in giving people yet another opportunity to turn him, turn to him before he brings final judgment. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so at any given time, how many people are being born at any time? How many people are dying at any given time? And it's actually a about 25%. So it actually does reflect what goes on in the world. 
So at any given time, there's about a quarter of us who are busy being born or busy dying. So it's just a reflection of reality. And then like you said, God limits, he still limits the forces of creation. Okay, and then talking about the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, so that is an illusion, illusion with an A, an illusion and not a very subtle illusion to the Neronian persecution of the Christians in the late 60s AD uh, when Christians were put into the arena for sport to fight wild animals. Um, that was right around the time of Apostle Paul's death, right around the late 60s. Did hundreds of thousands, thousands of Christians get killed in the arena? Probably not. There's really no evidence for that. And until recently, there was really no evidence any Christians had been put to death. That was just kind of always a tradition. There is evidence for it, uh, but it's not as big as like, oh yeah, you know, the Romans were always just murdering Christians willy-nilly in the, the arena. No, they didn't. They didn't do that. Uh, they did put a lot to death, but it's not as bad as people make it out to be in you know, that like, like you see the, you know, 200 Christians in the arena, you know, like cowering and praying with the lions around them. You see that in artwork and stuff. And that's, no. Uh, still, it was, you know, your dissidents, your people like Paul, your outspoken leaders uh, who were martyred. But yes, wild beasts of the earth. People were put to death for that, um, for sure. Okay, so... Now we got to ask ourselves the question, when are these events taking place? Are they taking place right in the first century or actually early second century before what's actually being written was taking place? Was it during John's time on Patmos in the late first century? Is it in some future time? Is it today? When is it? Because context is important. So when are these things taking place? Or when will they take place? And the answer is yes. <laughs> okay? These things are happening. They have been happening. That's the whole point of Revelation. Everything you read in that book, in that book takes place from the minute Jesus ascended into heaven until the second he comes again. All these things will take place. These are the things that must happen. So think about it, right? Do we have tyranny and oppression today? Yeah. Did they have that back in the first century? Oh, yeah. And are we still going to have it a thousand years from now? Probably. You know, and does that mean are we going to have death and bloodshed and war? Yeah, kind of always had that from like the beginning. We talked about Cain and Abel. It started at the beginning and it's still going on and it's not really getting any better. We keep coming up with new and better ways to kill, kill ourselves. All right, so do we have poverty and want and lack and starvation today? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And do it's always we, been here. Yeah, and, and then guess what? Do people still die? Yeah. So all these things have happened, and they're going to keep happening until Jesus comes back. So this is just describing the way the world is. It's actually, it's describing the world from our perspective. It's like, it's kind of like, oh yeah, you see these horsemen come out with all this stuff in history. And you're going, yeah, that is exactly what the world looks like. It's not really that subtle. There was a movie made. Oh, it, it's an awesome animated movie. It's like three hours and 30 minutes. It's a masterpiece. It's old. It's really, really old. Um, I can't think of the name of it, but it goes from the Garden of Eden to modern history. And it's, it's basically, I think it's like called Man's Intolerance to Man or Man's Inhumanity to Man. I think it's called Intolerance, actually. And it just basically goes through all the evil stuff we've done through like every war, every regime. And it gets uh, slightly more sophisticated anim animation as it goes on, but it's like just really brutal. Uh, kind of amazing glimpse at history from that perspective. So when we look at history, that's what we see. This is what we see going on right now. Uh, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, 6 and Mark 13, 7, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, right? Uh, we have rebellion, we have civil unrest, death and disease. Um, Revelation 4, 1, 
How does it come out in? Yeah, come up here and I will show you must, what must take place after this. Uh, it, is also it is also correct to translate that, show you these things which are necessary to come about after these things. So it's like, here are these things I'm going to show you and the things that must happen after these things I just showed you. Uh, the first of these things would be Christ's birth, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. Okay, so basically Jesus' entire mission of salvation. And then the things that are necessary to come about is everything else that happens after his ascension until the end of days. So this whole thing, the whole summary, these four seals the four, and the four horsemen, it's the story of man after the fall and continuing until the story ends. And you can also look at uh, Zechariah chapters 1, 6, and 10, if you like, sometime, and look at, just compare it to the way it was taught in the Old Testament. Uh, very, a lot of very similar language you're going to see. All right, so verse 9, the saints under the altar. Right, so these are... Page. We open the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge your blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So uh, the altar is the place of sacrifice. Right? Always, always the altar is the place of sacrifice throughout the Old Testament. Uh, and then the incense altar, so you know here was, the, here was the big altar where the burnt offerings were made, but then you had the incense altar where a pleasing aroma to the Lord was always burning. They always burned sweet incense. Uh, and prayer has always been symbolized as the incense moving up because you see the smoke rising to heaven. So I let my prayers rise before you as incense. Uh, so incense has always symbolized the prayers of, of the saints. So then here we have the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they had borne. So these aren't just saints. These aren't just those that die in Christ. These are the martyrs. These are the people who were killed specifically for the word of God and the testimony of it. Uh, at this point, there's re relatively few. You know, there aren't a whole lot of martyrs yet. Uh, by the time John is having this vision. But again, John is having a vision of heaven which is outside of time and space. So we always, always try to have that in our minds that what's happening in heaven is not in linear time with us necessarily. So he could be seeing... He could be seeing saints that have yet to be martyred that are already there. Um, and it's neither here nor there. But just always remember, heaven is outside of time and space. They cried out with a loud voice. Harkens back again to Genesis 4.10 when um, Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground. Uh, the prayers of these saints are seeking retribution. It's like, okay, yeah, we're dead. This is why we're dead. When are you going to get your revenge? Not our revenge, your revenge, God. Your revengeful God. So when are you going to, when are you going to revenge us? When's that going to happen? So these, these prayers are seeking retribution, uh, which are the imprecatory psalms, the ones we don't talk about too much, uh, which would be Psalms 69 and 109, uh, also including parts of 5, 6, 11, 12. There's a bunch of them. But these are the, the psalms that invoke judgment, that invoke calamity, and invoke curses on our enemies, which is basically what these martyrs are asking for. It's like, okay, we're dead. Vengeance. When are you going to have your vengeance? And that's what the imprecatory psalms are. They are when we ask God, okay, hmm, I want these people dead. I want, I want their baby skulls crushed and their teeth spilled out on the sidewalk. That's what one says. Wow. It's, it's, it's harsh. You're like reading that going, wow. <laughs> These are our prayers. They're the church's prayer book. So how are we supposed, they're our prayers. How are we ever supposed to pray that? So 
If you look at Psalm 69, 24, pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. Right? It's like, that sounds more like a God, do something about this. All right? You, you going to let them talk about you like that? It's almost like goading God into revenge. So why should we pray for our enemies to be like smushed? Well, we're actually, you're actually asking for God's revenge. You're asking for God's punishment. But you're also asking God, hey, God, I want these people dead. And I probably shouldn't do that. I shouldn't take this into my own hands. So I'm going to make my problem your problem. Now it's your problem. Now I'm good. I can let it go because now that vengeance is God's, not mine. I've given God my problem. It's his problem. The vengeance is his. And he's going to take care of it according to his will. Now I don't have to worry about it. And that's how you pray though. Say, yeah, God, I want these people dead. But now I've laid that at your feet. Now it's yours. Now I don't have to worry about it. So I don't go out and go killing people because they need killing. Because God's got my back and he's going to do what's right. Now I don't have to be vengeful. So the prickly bird comes, they're, they're an advanced concept of prayer, I think. You know, it's not for everybody because it's really hard not to, yeah, I'm going to go do something about that. No, you want God to do something about it so that you don't have to. So he gets to do righteous vengeance, which we have a hard time with. So just as an aside, but these saints under the altar, that's what they're asking for. They're asking for that kind of vengeance. All right, so they give, they're give they given a white robe. What, you want to say something? What, no? Those are really hard to pray. Yeah, they are. They're not for everybody. Because it's like, yeah, we're angry, and yeah, we want God to take over, and we want him to take that anger and that hatred from us, and we want him to pass the judgment. But I still don't understand, because when you're praying that, you're saying, okay, God, I want this person dead. I want you to smash this baby on a rock. That's telling God what you want, mm -hmm. which but the reality, is, that's passing judgment. You just give your hatred to him and let him pass the judgment. And you did. It's like, this is what I want, but whenever we pray, we're really saying, not your will, but mine. Well, not my will, but yours be done, right? It's very hard to pray. Sure it is. is. You know, which is why most people in Bible study are going to go, yeah, there's these psalms here. Nobody talks about them. Nobody talks about them. The only, the, in fact, the reason I started talking about them more was because I went to a Bible study at another church when I was in seminary, and we went, and they're like, well, I was too busy being jealous of the pastors there because there was like 125 people in church that morning, and there were 125 people in Bible study before church. Hmm. And you know what they're talking about? Like Article 5 of the Augsburg Confession. And I'm going, why are there 125 <laughs> people sitting here waiting to hang on his every word about stupid Article 5. Really? What are we all doing wrong, and how are they doing this? Because hey, the coffee and the donuts weren't that good. Although they, each everybody had like a real actual mug. They just had 100 mugs lined up, like actual mugs. You're kidding me. Anyway. But then somebody wrote, like raised their hand and went... I don't understand about the, it had nothing to do with Article 5. So it's like, well, yeah, I've been having tribes trying to understand the imprecatory psalms and sideways it went. And they talked for an hour about imprecatory psalms and I learned a lot. I was like, huh, I would have never, if I hadn't stopped, I would have never heard that. That's probably a good conversation. Yeah, it was so pretty good. Can we get mugs at Grace for everybody? Yeah, there we go. Uh, it was funny because the guy, that, the, the I think it was Pastor Peterson was doing it. And he goes, oh, no. Professor Mays, because yeah, everybody there is a pastor. Half the people there are pastors, so you can't just say pastor because everybody looks up. So it's like, Professor Mays, what do you have to say? About, like, what do the early Lutherans have to say about this? Like, well, he's like, dude, I was just here for Bible study too. Okay, I got to teach. <laughs> and, uh, and they start talking about this stuff, where it's like, this is really interesting. Like, start reading this. Like, I, have I ever really read them? It's like, I want the babies. Wow. That's a good question, because how do you pray that exactly? Yeah, so anyway, I still, I still don't know how they got 125 people in Bible study every Sunday. It's amazing. That's cool, though. It is cool. All right, so white robe always signifies the newness of life by baptism through Christ's salvific work for us. Uh, and it, it refers also to uh, eternal life. And it says, refer to the Lutheran Study Bible, note verse 11, which says... The white robe mentioned in 3 4 is more closely associated with the, Christ, with the Christian righteousness bestowed through baptism. 
Here it seems to represent eternal life. That said, baptism into Christ Jesus results in newness of life through the power of his resurrection, Romans 6, 4. God, in effect, asks the martyrs to continue waiting patiently while he gathers all the elect. All right, so he says, yeah, wait a little while because your numbers aren't complete because there's still going to be people martyred for my name. So you got to wait until all your brothers are there and then the vengeance will be had. Well, when does that mean the vengeance is going to be? You guys have to wait because all the martyrs aren't here yet in history. But when your number's complete, then I will have my vengeance on them. So when's that going to be? That is actually the last day. day. Yeah. The literal last day. So my vengeance will come, but not till your number is complete. And that's not till time's done. When we're done with time, then, then that'll happen. We don't know. So we do not know. Do you, do you know by any chance when or why man kind of now associates the white flag and the white cloth to surrendering? I don't know. I, I, I mean, white always means peace. I mean, that kind of goes... I mean, I always, I always thought on a battlefield, like if you have something that's white, it's going to grab your attention because you think a battle isn't anything but that because it's clean. I don't know. Interesting. I'll have to look that up. Uh, yeah, so they are not done until God says time is done. All right, then verse 12. Every time you see this, it means the world just ended. So if you're ever having trouble reading Revelation or you're talking to someone who is new at interpreting it correctly and they want to read it like a story from beginning to end, which you can't do because you come up with all kinds of false teaching if you do that. Uh, because we, like we just got the history of the world from man's perspective. We're going to get history of the world from God's perspective in another sevenfold vision. It's the same story from different views. Uh, if you ever have someone who's having trouble dealing with this, you could explain to them, whenever you see there was a great earthquake and the sun became black and the moon became like blood and all the stars of the, stars of the sky fell to the earth, the world just ended. Okay, the world just ended, time to start again. That's going to happen several times in this book. So the sixth seal, there are seven seals, by the way, but the sixth seal is the end of time, the end of days. The great earthquake is always picture language for the last day. And you can see that in Haggai chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 12. And then again, verse 13, the sun became black as sackcloth, which is also picture language for the last day. Sackcloth was always worn in periods of mourning. You can see Job 16, 15 and Matthew 11, verse 21 for that. And then also in verse 12, the full moon became like blood. Great cosmic events are always symbolic of the last day. Uh, also, they are sometimes literal as Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Uh, also in those same verses, Jesus talked about, as it does here in verse 13, the stars of the sky will fall. Uh, also in verse 13, the fig tree. Which Mark 13 is that when he curses the fig tree? Mark 15. Mark 13. words of rumors of wars do not be alarmed this must take place but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom there will be earthquakes in various places there will be famines these are but the beginning of the birth pains okay so that's what he's talking about fig tree 1328 oh from the fig tree learn its lesson as soon as the branch becomes tender put out its leaves you know the summer is near okay so he's just talking about Yeah, the fig tree sheds its winter fruit like second by the gale. Okay. Yeah, he's just... Talking about the whole end, end is near thing? Yeah, the end is near, but it's not yet. It's coming, but it's not yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, earthquakes, sun, moon, stars, uh, all over the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2, chapter 3, Isaiah 34. Um, and then verse 14, the sky vanished. Every mountain and island is moved from its place. 
Uh, basically, it's the end of the ver- visible universe because you know God's going to do the whole new heavens and new earth, which means the old heaven and the new earth have to pass away. So the firmament in Genesis chapter 1, God separated the firmament above from the firmament below and the waters from the waters. Um, that will cease to be. That, that separation will be gone. Right? The laws of nature will be rescinded. Uh, the earth will vanish the same way it came. It got spoken into existence and it's going to get spoken out. Verse 15, look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10. Everyone will tremble in terror at the great day of the Lord. The great and terrible day, it's usually described at. They'll tremble in terror. Verse 16, also look at Numbers chapter 16. No one is going to want to face the power of the Almighty God on the day of judgment, especially the people who didn't believe. Because all of a sudden it's going to be like, really? (laughs) Holy it's like, okay, you might as well just the mountains and stuff, they can fall on me now because this is not going to end well for me, right? They're going to know. There's going to be no doubt. Just like it says here in verse 17, for the great day of wrath has come, and who can stand? Look at Psalm 130, verse 3. Nobody. Nobody's going to be able to stand. So I need to use this Bible more. I can't flip the pages that fast. There we go. Psalm 130, verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, we could stand. But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so in chapter 6, we've seen the entire history of the world. From the beginning of time to the end of time. Those that have heard the word of God, that through that hearing and taking it to heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, come to knowledge of their own miserable condition, right? Their sin and their utter worthlessness before God, and they know they have no option than to suffer eternal damnation if left to their own merit. But they will also know the sweet, blessed comfort of the gospel, that they have a Savior, the Lamb who was slain and yet lives forever, who bore the full furious wrath of God upon himself as a flesh and blood man. After living that perfect life, we can't. Dying our justly deserved death and then defeating death and now offers us eternal life with him. So for those who believe in him, the last day will not bring judgment. It still could be pretty terrifying, I think. But it will not bring judgment. A new day that will last for eternity, free from sin, free from death, free from the power of the devil, and a new heaven and a new earth. Everybody forgets the new earth. Now, the seventh seal is going to open next week at the beginning of chapter 8, which is going to introduce a second, second fold, sevenfold vision. So the first sevenfold vision, the last seal opens the first thing in the next vision, uh, which is the vision of the trumpet angels. Uh, but first, there's going to be an interlude in the action in uh, chapter 7, showing the sealing of God's elect. But then we'll get to the seventh seal, which opens the trumpet angels. So it you get this pause. And we will talk about the 144,000, I think, next week. All right? Yes. So. I got questions there. Yep. Yeah, for that Cause, seven. Because the list is wrong. If you look Chapter at, six, one. The list of the 12 seven, tribes. Those so aren't the 12 tribes of Israel. Seven part judgments. Yep. I mean, they kind of are, but they're kind of not. Right. So. Yeah, so there's good stuff next week, and we'll find out why. The, that's where we will stop. <laughs>